Eastern University's launch event for Interfaith Dialogue. My name is Joseph Modica and I serve as the university chaplain. As a Christian university rooted in faith, reason, and justice, we are called to develop the necessary skills to have meaningful conversations and relationships with people of other religions and faith traditions. It's a way we can follow Jesus more faithfully in this world. We are glad you have joined us this morning for this presentation, and this presentation will be recorded. I'd like to begin with a prayer, uh, an interfaith prayer from the Christian tradition. So would you join me in prayer as we begin? Let us pray. God of all people, open our hearts to understanding of other faith traditions. We are all made in your image and, and seek to know and follow your ways, to praise you and to be instruments of your holy presence. May we respect those who are different from us, who follow a different faith tradition than us. May we seek to know the truth of your word and find common ground among the many faith traditions and recognize that we share a common humanity. Help us to be people of compassion and understanding, creating a path to a peaceful coexistence among all people. Amen. Amen. We now have a video from um, our president, President Matthews. Hi, my name is Ron Matthews, and I serve as president of Eastern University. I regret not being able to participate in real time for this important premier event made possible through the efforts of Interfaith Youth Corps. Thank you to Dr. Ebu Patel, founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps, Ms. Mary Ellen Geis, Vice President of Strategic Initiative for Interfaith Youth Corps, and Ms. Hannah Minx, Program Manager at Interfaith Youth Corps, for making this project possible and for their support. I express special gratitude to our speakers, Dr. Phaedra Blocker and Dr. Jackie Irving from Eastern University, and to our keynote speaker, Dr. Marion Larson, from Bethel University, co-author of From Bubble to Bridge, Educating Christians for a Multi-Faith World. Representing a member institution of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, and on behalf of Eastern University, I welcome all attendees and participants with special appreciation for University Chaplain, Dr. Joe Modica, Dr. Lindy Backus, Associate Professor of Economic Development, and Dr. Tara Stoppum, Associate Professor of Psychology and Co-Chair of the Psychology Department, and this year's Lindbach Distinguished Teaching Award recipient. I would also like to thank God for creating us all in the divine image of our first parents. Given the paradoxical nature of religion, fostering faith, belief, rituals, propagation, or proselytizing, genuine, informed, and respectful interfaith conversations risk superficiality, syncretism, or secret haughtiness. I mean, after all, shouldn't we all be reasonable and believe like I do? 
Jesus warned about this presumption when he rebuked the religious professionals saying, you travel across sea and land to make a single convert. And when one becomes such a proselyte, you make him twice the child of hell as yourself. And yet the same Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We do know that Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to care for the other, the poor, the suffering, the needy and the different. He made heroes of those who would have otherwise been ostracized by the clergy or the dominant culture. And so I am excited about this project. We have the opportunity to listen and engage and learn in a framework of compassion and respect, to explore difference and commonality, to appreciate the other, without necessarily surrendering individual and communal beliefs. May God, who is merciful and gracious, bless you. Amen. Thank you. We are grateful to uh, President Matthews um, for sharing that. He unfortunately could not be with us uh, in person this morning, but we're very grateful for his good words. Um, I am Tara Stapa, and we begin this important series of conversations together, which are part of a grant for which Eastern University was selected to participate in an invited cohort of 18 colleges and universities across the United States. The grant is sponsored through Interfaith Youth Corps, a nationally recognized nonprofit organization that promotes interfaith understanding and engagement among college students in support of the common good. The grant, which is officially titled Courageous Pluralism, provides funds to support programming and experiences during the grant period focused on raising awareness of the importance of interfaith cooperation in civic life with an emphasis on creating meaningful dialogue across areas of difference to counter trends towards polarization in our communities and especially urgent need in our current historical moment. During this grant period and we hope beyond, we will focus on listening to and learning from one another and others outside of our community, community engaging important issues such as how do we work across areas of deep difference to avoid polarization and to build civic community? How do we leverage interfaith engagement to love our neighbors who are different from us, including religiously different, to cooperate and build a better society together? The 18 colleges and universities participating in the grant cohort reflect the themes of the grant, diverse in type, affiliation, and size, some faith-based and some non-faith-based, some public, some private, some large, some small, and represent different regions of the country. Within the cohort, a small number of CCCU member institutions, including Eastern, are likewise represented. When we attended the grant convening in February in Washington, D.C., we were pleased to be joined by members of the CCCU leadership team as well, who are partnering with IFYC on a few initiatives. As part of the grant cohort, each of the 18 schools involved are also partnering with another school. Our campus is honored to partner with Lincoln University, the country's oldest degree granting HBCU, historically black college or university, located in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Since February, we've been meeting regularly via Zoom with our colleagues at Lincoln and together we hope to offer some joint initiatives. We are immensely grateful to our colleagues and partners at Lincoln. Reverend Dr. Frederick Faison, Associate Vice President for Student Success, Health, Wellness, and University Chaplain. Maxine Cook, 
assistant to the Associate Vice President for Student Success, Health and Wellness, and faculty member Professor Shante Barrett, professor and assistant to the chaplain. I'm also grateful to Drs. Modica and Bacchus who are co-leading the grant efforts along with me, as well as an exceptional working group of faculty, staff, and students who I, I'm going to share my screen with you in just a moment, uh, who uh, have spoken into uh, the, the grant, who have participated in conversations about these efforts uh, and have been um, faithful um, in helping us to, uh, to, to think through um, the, the, what the grant may look like and also beyond. And we are so grateful um, to um, uh, those um, faculty, staff, and students who are assisting with that. We are also especially grateful to Reverend Dr. Blocker, Dr. Irving, both members of our working group who are among our distinguished panelists this morning, along with Dr. Marion Larson of Bethel University, who have been generous resources as we embark on these efforts. Importantly, we begin the series of conversations with deep appreciation to Interfaith Youth Corps and the funders of this important opportunity. And as our chaplain, Dr. Modica, has so beautifully expressed, as we work to inspire students to become virtuous and productive citizens in the world, learning how to love God and their neighbors well. And I'll now, now turn it over to um, Dr. Modica and Dr. Bacchus. Thank you, Dr. Stampa. The name of this grant that we received is called Courageous Pluralism. Dr. Bacchus and I will take a moment now just to talk about a couple of concepts we just like to place on the table this morning for our community. The question we are grappling with is the important and oftentimes confusing difference between relativism and pluralism. Yeah, we've all got to get used to using the, the screens in the way that we do here, yeah? <laughs> um, we're we're going we're gonna to keep this very, very short because we're anticipating our two panelists and our speaker, but this is just a five-minute um, kind of um, a presentation because it's, as we gathered together the many, the many institutions there at IFYC at the beginning of, of February, one of the things that made us kind of distinctive is we're a creedal institution, a creedal university. We're, we're, we're Christian. And each and every one of our faculty and staff, we've signed uh, it's a, a creedal uh, assent. And so one of the things we wanted to wrestle with is how do we do this faithfully um, in light of courageous pluralism, but not to um, give up our distinctives. Um, and, and one of the things that Joe and I wanted to focus in on is this difference between uh, relativism and pluralism. And um, again, this is very, very short, and I'm sure the panelists and, and Dr. Larson will We'll have more to fill in uh, as they they present, but we wanted to to point out that there is a difference between uh, relativism and pluralism. First off, um, relativism um, is basically the idea, and this is not some sort of an absolute definition. Certainly, it could be tweaked, but that all macro worldviews and religious systems are in the end equally valid, and that they must be affirmed as legitimate and non-critiquable. Um, I. In some of the writings I've done on some of this kind of stuff, I've, I've, I've basically prefer, especially in anthropology, to use the term kind of cultural relativism. And the idea is that, you know, it's wrong to critique each other, especially in it with any kind of seriousness, uh, that, we, that it's utterly just an issue of, this, uh, of, of, um, of listening. Whereas the second, pluralism, is the idea that Every macro worldview is best allowed to speak on its own terms. It's to, it's, it should be allowed to be understood in its own idiom and be evaluated in terms of its own internal logic. Now, I uh, like to make the distinction between cultural relativism, this being cultural relativity. And this second portion that Joe will unpack a little bit more is we think incredibly important for all humans um, that there is, we do live in a pluralist world, we live in a varied, and beautiful, uh, variegated world, and that um, we need to listen to each other deeply, humbly, um, as Dr. Matthew says, not with any kind of audacity or, or, or haughtiness. Um, but we need to also open up space where we can, after we understand each other in our own idiom, that we can evaluate each other in terms of our own internal logic 
and recognizing that, that we are able to speak even sometimes difficult truths, but with humility and kindness and respect. Thank you, Dr. Backus. When I think of pluralism, I think of one of the pioneers of pluralism is Dr. Diana Eck from Harvard Divinity School. She is the uh, founder of the Pluralism Project that we began in 1991. I'm just going to reveal four of her major points. These are her points, and I'll make a statement after each one just to highlight how she defines pluralism. The first point is pluralism is not diversity alone, but the energetic engagement with diversity. I love that term, energetic engagement. So uh, pluralism is not simply gathering religions, so to speak, in one room, but actually allowing them to be engaging with one another. The second is from Diana Eck, pluralism is not just tolerance, but the active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. How can we learn to appreciate and not just tolerate people from different religious traditions? It is about deep appreciation among our differences. Thirdly, pluralism, as noted by Dr. Backus, is not relativism, but the encounter of commitments. It is a form of relativity, comparing religions to each other on their own terms. We recognize the deep differences religions have but can we admire what makes people of uh, what makes people of different religions tick, so to speak? Can we understand why they believe what they believe and understanding their own commitments? And then lastly, this is one of my favorite points that Diana Eck makes. Pluralism is based on dialogue. The language of pluralism is that of dialogue and encounter, give and take, criticism and self-criticism. Dialogue means both speaking and listening. It reveals both common understandings and real differences. Pluralism recognizes the presence of differences, but it focuses on dialogue, shared learning, and friendships. As uh, Dr. Eck notes at the end of an article on pluralism, she says that the active engagement of diversity to a positive end. So we hope that this is helpful. It's very brief, but I think it's really important and why the project that we're involved in, the grant is called Courageous Pluralism. Well, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, who is also my supervisor. So I must be careful what I say. No, that's not, not, that's not at all uh, where I'm going, but... Uh, <laughs> I am delighted to work with and be supervised by Dr. Jackie Irving, who's been a member of the student development team since 2001, serving as, in various roles at Eastern University, including retention specialist, career counselor, academic advisor, adjunct professor for INST 150, the EQUIP Summers Program, and former director of the Wilson Good Scholars Program and the founding director of the Multicultural Initiative. She has done and continues to do excellent work at the university. Dr. Jackie is grateful for opportunities to serve students. So Dr. Irving, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. When I was given this assignment, um, oftentimes I reflect back on my history. So what I'd like to do this morning is share my story with you on how creating meaningful interfaith dialogue to counter towards um, polarization and communities impacted my life. Um, for me, a seed was planted early, um, elementary school. Uh, for many of us, our experience and how we live in community are often shaped by what we see demonstrated by church, pastors, family members, friends, and sometimes strangers. My experience in how I view and live out interfaith cooperation for building community and civic society um, from a Christian perspective comes from 
family, uh, particularly my maternal grandparents, um, who were, for me, an early example of interfaith cooperation um, by demonstrating how to live in a pluralistic interfaith uh, religious community. While our family identified as Christians, I witnessed my grandparents serve in leadership roles um, in the NAACP, um, the Chester branch specifically. They served alongside Christians, Muslims, and people of Jewish faith. Um, during my generation, um, you, you didn't ask too many questions. Um, you kind of did what you were told and followed along quietly. And so I did a lot of that and um, quietly listening and follow along really um, shaped my future and where I am today. My grandfather served on the NAACP executive board as the membership chair. So um, obviously he was responsible for increasing and uh, retaining membership. He worked alongside of uh, the local president, uh, Raymond George, um, real Roy Wilkins, the national president of the NAACP, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Thurgood Marshall, and Cecil B. Moore. And oftentimes when we hear some of the names that I just mentioned, we think of them as um, having competing interest in, um, despite what we've read in the media, um, that was not always the case. They worked side by side um, for a common goal. During um, the week, my grandfather would meet with one of the um, local ministers from um, Islamic faith, we actually called him uh, Mr. Benny. Um, he would come to the house, they would study um, the Quran, and while they were studying the Quran, they would also study the Bible. Um, I watched them have spirited discussions on Islam, Christianity, and at the time, the civil rights movement. Uh, while their conversations ranged in topics, it would always circle back around to increasing uh, the NAACP membership, um, voter registration, and securing um, housing and rights for marginalized people in diverse communities. Though I was only in elementary school, I understood at the time the importance of civic engagement as I would go with my uh, grandmother into the voting booth and she would point to the candidate's name and I had the luxury and pleasure of casting her vote. Um, I would look forward to attending meetings with them, community events with my grandparents, um, working on and preparing for local elections, distributing clothing and food um, during various seasons. And the individuals that participated with them, again, were um, Christians, Muslims, and their Jewish friends. Fast forward a bit to my early teens. Um, I was introduced to Catholicism. Um, while enrolled in Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic School. Um, initially, it was a bit of culture shock. Um, however, I quickly embraced the devotion and respect shown to Jesus's mother, Mary. I witnessed the consistent esteem that the Catholic religion had for the mother of Jesus and had only experienced in the Christian faith at that time during Christmas time, Jesus's birthday. Um, that would be a time when you heard a lot about Mary. Um, what was fascinating for me was that in Catholic school, when 
during mass and church. Um, Mary seemed to be revered and, and held in high esteem um, in, the, in the Catholic faith. As part of community service in middle school, our civic duty included developing and planning activities for uh, child, local children in the neighborhood. Uh, once a week, we would block off the street so that middle and high school students could host activities uh, for the neighbors. Our middle school volleyball team would host um, Bible studies and teach catechisms to um, local community kids. Um, and then we would offer a volleyball clinic or volleyball camp during the summers to the students in the community. These activities created opportunities for us to get to know not only students in the community and to serve them, but to engage in dialogue and conversation about, and it wasn't deep religious conversation. It was more of where do you go to church on Sunday? What does your family do? What are you doing this summer? Um, and being invited to vacation Bible schools at their churches. While my mom has been a consistent demonstration of living out faith in a civic society, um, she participated as a youth member in the NAACP in an unwavering freedom rider. Her commitment to civic engagement continued as she embodied the example for um, what the Bible teaches us with regard to welcome the, welcoming the stranger by serving as the local community and organizer um, for education and coordinating buses to the local schools for the children of migrant workers. And during that time, when undocumented migrant workers uh, came to Pennsylvania, they were welcomed across the border and we shared our faith and our resources with those families. By the time I entered uh, Chester High School and my beloved HBCU, Chain University, engaging with people of diverse faiths and participating in civic engagement um, and community seemed natural. It wasn't something that I thought about or gave a name to. It was just um, the right thing to do. It was part of who I was. It had been instilled in me, as I said, early on. So I never gave it much thought. We just did it and, and lived it out. And there was never any resistance to it. It, it. it felt natural. I've had the privilege of participating in the legislative process while working on various electoral campaigns um, with my mom, volunteering, um, fundraising for scholarship, and facilitating college uh, preparation workshops for high school students with um, my sorority sisters during COVID, especially um, deepening my interfaith experiences and civic engagement has not stopped, um, surprisingly. Um, I've had the opportunity while being sheltered in to um, read and watch um, and experience a variety of diverse religions um, and participate. I also participate in a women's Bible study with my sorority sisters from different religious denominations. And um, the, the conversation is often centered in the scripture and Bible study is often centered around loving thy neighbor and, and doing well and good for others. Um, the aforementioned experiences and participation in civic organizations virtually have um, continued to shape my inner faith and civic experience actually giving me uh, a time to reflect and, and honestly a deeper appreciation and understanding of what it's like to, to live in community and um, engage with people of different faiths and um, the importance of appreciation, appreciating that with everything that's currently going on in the world. What has been most interesting is that uh, for me, 
I only learned um, while reflecting on my life and participating in this um, working group um, and, and preparing for this panel that something that my grandparents just naturally instilled in me as a child setting the foundation actually has a formal name. Um, as a Christian, my faith is centered on Jesus' love for all, Micah 6, 8, and the Ten Commandments. As a U.S. citizen, my civic responsibilities are centered on issues affecting my community, being involved and uplifting my community, participating in the democratic process, respecting and obeying federal, state, and local laws, um, and more specifically, respecting the rights and beliefs and opinions of others. Um, as a woman, my humanity is centered on gratitude as I um, stand on the shoulders of my grandparents and my ancestors for introducing me to faith and the welcoming spirit to engage others in conversation who may share a different religious belief um, and a different faith background. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Irving. You can see why we're so proud of the, the working group, not only our colleagues at Eastern, so marvelous rep represented by Dr. Irving, but our working group, she's one of those uh, persons and there's several others that are participating as well. And I'm about now to rep uh, introduce our second panel speaker, who's also part of our working group and who will also, who also makes us proud and will make us proud. Uh, Dr. Phaedra de Blocker, Reverend Dr. Blocker, um, has a passion for empowering individuals and organizations to move forward uh, toward whole, wholeness and actualize their potential. She currently serves as an affiliate professor in leadership and formation and assistant director of the Open Seminary here at Palmer's uh, Theological Seminary of Eastern University. She has um, formerly been the director of programs for the New Baptist Covenant. Her ministry experience includes oversight of discipleship and pastoral care ministries, counseling, serving as an associate pastor for a congregation of 10,000 plus members, and as an assistant pastor for a small librarian congregation. So she also has more than 30 years experience in management, community relations, community communications, marketing, and program and organizational development. Um, she holds a BA from Temple University and MDiv from our own Palmer uh, Seminary, which was then Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a DMN in spiritual transformation from Northern Baptist Theological Seminary. We are very proud to have Dr. Blocker uh, share with us this morning. Thank you, Lindy, and thank you, everyone. I'm so delighted that we are doing this and um, honored to be able to share. Um, somewhat like Jackie, I, I kind of don't remember not having a, um, a sense of being with all kinds of people. Um, my, my parents always had friends of different ethnicities and cultures and, and backgrounds and including religious. And so grew up that way. Um, my dad's grandmother uh, was uh, an Orthodox Jew, uh, an African American. And so there's, um, ha has a very kind of unique history. He used to tell us really funny stories about being the only black kid in North Philadelphia being kept home on Jewish holidays. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that has always been kind of part of my understanding that the world is big and that people are people. Um, growing up, uh, grew up with next door neighbors who were Jewish and uh, an older couple and they, my brother and I, younger brother and I always thought of them as kind of our bonus grandparents because they treated us like their grandkids. And so that, that part, that, you know, sensibility for me has always been um, real and true. And uh, the I was blessed to go to schools where there were lots of different types of kids. And so we 
you know, we figured it out. We built relationships, still have relationships with some of those folks to this day and appreciated, you know, the, the, the ways that we were children together and, and teens together and learned from each other and appreciated um, and exchanged, you know, uh, in, in friendship. Um, in, my, in my adult years, um, I, I think that through just working in different places, I kind of carried that sensibility with me um, into those spaces. Um, and then I, I think in more recent years in particular, so I, in the, the church where I served on staff, a large church, um, it was a congregation that um, did work with other uh, faith communities in the uh, area to um, help the community to, you know, the, 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 the idea of that, that there is a deep intersectionality often happening. And, and so at some point folks have to look beyond their religious boundaries or traditions and say what's best for the community. And so I'm proud to be a part of a congregation that, that did and does that. But also on a personal level, uh, one of the opportunities that I've had, and this is, um, I think, helped deepen my commitment to interfaith engagement uh, and as well as shape it somewhat, and I want to talk about another way in which it's shaped as well, is uh, when I was beginning my doctoral program and um, looking for resources to help me do my doctoral program, uh, I was introduced to the Ruthbert Fund. Uh, Tony and Albert Ruthbert are a couple who deeply believed in um, education and spirituality and in the riches of different kinds of spirituality. And so they started a fund to help those who were pursuing education, uh, but who also were bringing to that education their own um, sense of what it meant to live out of their spirituality into their various vocations. And as a part of this, uh, so I was, I was, you know, blessed to be able to uh, get a grant and become a Ruth Burt Fellow. And uh, one of the ongoing pieces that the fund has been committed to is bringing together fellows twice a year uh, for retreats. And that has been, I've made some wonderful friends out of that. And each time that we come together, we focus on a different topic and, and the folks in the room come from all traditions, no traditions, and we get to exchange and get to wrestle with different issues and, and to bring our whole selves to those moments. And that has, I know, impacted me, just it, my shaping as a person, but also the way that I look at educating and the way that I look at um, the practice of my faith and interaction with others. And so um, if, if I think about uh, what it means for me to be a clergy person, um, to be a seminary professor, uh, to do the work that um, I did for a couple years um, and, and have in other ways around justice um, and, and uh, reconciliation and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, am, I realize I've been very influenced by um, something David Benner deals with in his wonderful book, The Gift of Being Yourself. He talks about the fact that we have three levels of calling from God. We're called to live our shared humanity. Uh, we are called to follow Christ and to, as the path to the fulfillment of that humanity and, and life with God. And then we're called to live out the uniqueness of who we are um, in, and who we're being and becoming, uh, not only in the world, but for the sake of the world. And, and that, um, sense of calling has really shaped my understanding of an approach to interfaith engagement because I really believe that we are first and foremost human beings uh, who are equally created in the image of God and equally cherished by God. And so the measure to which we lose sight of the humanity of others is for me the measure to which we increasingly lose our own humanity. Um, and so it doesn't matter, you know, what religious tradition, what faith tradition you're in, what ethnicity or culture or nationality, or even the quality of someone's character. And, and you know, that's, that's probably the hardest one for us sometimes. 
um, I know sometimes for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm called to see every other human as someone specifically loved and cherished by God. And, you know, I'm, I'm real clear that doesn't happen in a day. Um, I'm clear that there are moments when I'm tempted to forget, when I do forget, uh, when I'm brought up short, um, to realize that it's still a growing edge for me. But I'm clear about that trajectory, that, that we, we're called to a shared humanity and, and we can't let go of that. Um, second, the call to follow Christ uh, for me means that I embrace and internalize the teachings of the one who taught us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, uh, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And, and so uh, I, I notice in that that Jesus goes on to be very clear about the expansiveness of his definition of neighbor. And, and I think that um, he's probably being very intentional in, in his parable about using a neighbor who is religiously and culturally different. So again, I can't walk back from that essentially without walking away from the Christ whom I have committed to follow. To, to me, they, they, there's no way to separate those two. Particularly when Jesus makes it clear that um, the way that he evaluates our faithfulness, of, of our faithful following, so to speak, um, is by looking at how we treat people who are different from us, um, who aren't of our tribe, who aren't, um, you know, whether that's cultural or religious or ethnic or, or whatever. And so um, that then sort of leads me to the third calling that Dana talks about, um, the calling to live out the uniqueness of who we are in the world and for the sake of the world. Um, and, and I don't believe that that call is limited to those who use the label Christian. Um, I do believe that it is in and through Christ, um, as Benner says, that we are led into the fullness of our humanity and into fullness of union with God. At the same time, uh, and I don't, I, I am not someone who believes in syncretism or, or relativism, um, but at the same time, I've always been intrigued by something that Jesus says in John 10, 16. He says, I have sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. And I know that typically as Christians, we have assumed that he is referring to the Gentiles. He's talking to a Jewish audience, and we assume he's, talk, he's referring to Gentiles. And I think that that is a true and right way to interpret what he says, um, and it makes sense. But I've always been intrigued because I've always wondered if there's room for a broader interpretation of other sheep and other folds. And, and mainly because I see, as I look at, and, and others have talked about this earlier, um, when I look at some of the richness and what I would call commonalities or universal truths that I've seen in other uh, faith traditions, um, it points me very clearly um, back to the essence of Jesus's model and message, um, back to the calling to love God and love neighbor and love self. Um, and then back to the calling out of the uniqueness of who we all are, including our different, from our different faith traditions, to speak the, meet, the needs of a, a, of a fractured and suffering world. Uh, to seek, as, as uh, Dr. Jackie said, to um, live into Micah 6-8, which is one of my, my life verses, you know, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Um, I think it takes all of us, uh, all of us who accept that first call to be human, uh, to do that work from wherever we stand in terms of faith tradition. And, and so we're called as humans to be human by being the unique reflection of God who we are and to be neighbors and to cherish each other's humanity. And I, I hope that um, in the work that I do, um, I hope that, you know, within this context of being a Christian university, that we are seeking to help our students understand how to do that uh, without feeling that they're doing injury to their own faith commitment. Uh, because if we are going to build a healthy um, civic society, if, if we're going to do the things that really we believe um, that Jesus calls us to do, uh, we have to learn how to 
build bridges. We, we have to learn how to start at the place where we can be together rather than looking for just the places that separate us. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Blocker, um, for those very, very important uh, insights. Um, it is now um, my opportunity to uh, introduce our, our final speaker, um, Dr. Marion Larson, um, who is a professor of English at Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She has served as a visiting scholar and member of the Board of Directors for the Collaboration for the Advancement of College Teaching and Learning. She also served as the Arts and Humanities Editor for Christian Scholars Review and her written work on interfaith and has written work on interfaith engagement, faculty development, and hospitality as a metaphor for teaching. Her work on interfaith engagement has been published in journals such as Psychology of Religion and Spirituality, Christian Higher Education, the Journal of College and Character, and several others. And uh, with her Bethel colleague, Sarah Shady, um, she uh, has co-authored, I'll show you uh, the book here, From Bubble to Bridge, uh, uh, Educating Christians for a Multi-Faith uh, World. And so um, we are so pleased uh, to have uh, Dr. Larson also sharing with us today. Great, thanks. I'm gonna also try a screen share here because I've got a few slides. Uh, sorry, hang on one second. I'm gonna be focusing uh, my comments on, I can make my slides open, so sorry. There we go. Um, I'm going to focus my comments on uh, four, uh, these four points. There we go. So why should Christians participate in interfaith engagement and cooperation? Uh, these aren't in any particular order of importance. And in fact, I would argue that the last category that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is the most important one. So the, the Four, uh, the four categories I'm going to talk about are, um, are these four. The first two, I would argue, are largely uh, inward focused, largely personal things, um, deepening one's own faith commitment, developing skills and personal capacities. Um, maybe the second one is largely a pragmatic argument. And then the, the third point, uh, benefit society, and then the fourth, to obey Christ's command to love our neighbors, are the two that are very outward focused. So those are the four categories of my comments. So let me talk, uh, first of all, about deepening one's own faith commitment. And uh, you'll see in my slides that I've got a few places where I've used uh, light blue to highlight something. Um, one of the things that my colleague Sarah Shady and I do in our book is uh, we talk a bit about uh, what we call uh, virtues that we think are necessary for constructive interfaith engagement. Um, this is part of what we articulate with our colleagues and with our students, trying to be upfront about here are the kinds of qualities we're trying to develop in ourselves and the kinds of qualities we're trying to develop in our students. And so uh, one point I would make about uh, just kind of as a lead into the faith commitment is I think it's really important to think about trying to develop a and maintain a productive tension between what we might call receptive humility on the one side, which is uh, the willingness to recognize your own flaws and limitations, um, the, willing, the willingness to receive from and learn from others, a uh, uh, willingness to receive an outsider perspective on Christianity and openness to change. So that's kind of the receiving side, the openness to change side, and then equally important, but kind of at times in tension with receptive humility is the importance of reflective commitment. So the kind of the two, um, yeah, the, the two uh, things that could on the surface sound contradictory. One is 
humility, I've got openness, I'm willing to acknowledge that I might be wrong, that Christianity in the way it's been practiced at various times might even have flaws to it, at least Christian practice. Um, and then on the other side, the desire to hang firmly to my particular commitments. And so uh, one of the things that interfaith engagement can do is can help encourage participants to explore and try to maintain and develop this tension um, between openness and commitment. And then the other comment I wanna make about uh, deepening faith commitment is that there's a very large body of research that I don't have time to talk about right now that talks about the importance of challenge in a context of support in promoting especially faith development. And uh, when especially uh, traditional college age students have been studied in this regard. Um, those who, uh, they will often talk about a significant challenge, maybe a personal crisis that they faced um, in their lives. And those who emerge on the other side with a stronger faith commitment, a more mature faith commitment, are the ones who had the kind of support they needed to get through that. And interfaith engagement can be one of the kinds of challenges that we deliberately present uh, students with in a context of support. So uh, continuing with the deepening my understanding of my own faith commitment, I would argue that um, interfaith engagement can be productive because it helps me uh, expand my view of God. And I think about things that uh, some religions, uh, I'll take, is, uh, many of my examples are gonna come from Islam because that's the area that I, uh, I teach a class in most frequently. Um, but in reading the Quran, especially some of the earliest uh, chapters in the Quran, the earliest revelations, it's like reading Psalms that really emphasize God's sovereignty and God's greatness. And that's something that the Christian Bible teaches. That's something that Christians believe also. But I think that um, Muslims that I know take the notion of God's greatness really seriously. And that's something that challenges me as a Christian to think, yet, yes, I have that view in common also. And that can help to deepen my own commitment. Um, there's also the opportunity to learn from wise people of faith, uh, regardless of their tradition. Um, the, the late John Lewis, a very uh, committed and outspoken Christian, um, talked often about the important role that uh, Gandhi's writings had in shaping uh, Lewis's own thinking about uh, participation in civil rights and the fact that Gandhi was Hindu didn't diminish Lewis's Christian faith. If anything, it helped to enhance his Christian faith. Um, I think about also, if I really get to know people from other faith traditions who take their religion and their spirituality seriously, it challenges me similarly to live out my own faith commitments. Um, I think about, uh, for example, several Muslims that I know who take very seriously the challenges that living in a uh, secular society can uh, present to people who want to be faithful to their own, uh, to their own faith tradition. Um, the challenge to try to find answers to questions that are raised. Uh, if I'm in a discussion with, um, let's say with, with a Muslim, or we're, we're talking about uh, reading the Quran together, questions about the divinity of Christ, about the Trinity, that as a Christian, I know I believe, and I remember taking classes in college um, along those lines, but could I really articulate clearly why I believe that God is triune? Um, and so challenging me to go back and, uh, and really dig in to find answers. Um, here is uh, my friend Amber, who has been on staff at uh, Interfaith Youth Corps for a long time. Here's what Amber, who uh, self-identifies as an evangelical Christian, has to say about the impact that interfaith engagement has had on her faith life. Um, she says, engaging with religious difference and learning about other traditions hasn't made me want to convert or let go of my faith. In fact, quite the opposite has happened. 
when I learned that my friend, that my Muslim friend Yusra play, prays five times a day, I felt called to look at my own prayer life and think about how I could make it a more regular practice. When I found out my Jewish friend Josh fasted for Yom Kippur, I was inspired to look at what a fasting practice might look like in my own tradition. When I spoke with my atheist friend Adam, who doesn't believe in God, but believes that this is the only life we get and we have an obligation to serve others, his passion and commitment to humanity calls me to think about what it means to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Okay, so that's a whole bunch of thoughts about how uh, in interfaith engagement can help to uh, develop a deepen our understanding of our own faith commitments. Another category of comments is that I would argue that interfaith engagement and interfaith cooperation can help to uh, develop skills and personal capacities. This is kind of the pragmatic side of it. Um, you know, we talk often about the importance of cultural competence, the kind of cultural competence that's needed to be good citizens and employees and neighbors. And the comments from both Dr. Irving and Dr. Blocker help to make that evident. And a piece of cultural competence includes also um, the, the kinds of skills and knowledge we might gain through interfaith engagement, because increasingly there are people in the world and in American society for whom their uh, religious beliefs are one of the primary ways that they self-define and that uh, have an impact on how they seek to be neighbors, employees, or citizens. So if we are to work well with such people, we need to think about as Christians, um, how, how, might, uh, how might I help my Christian students who want to go into nursing uh, serve better their patients who are uh, Muslim, for example? Um, I would argue related to cultural capacity or cultural competence that the virtue of imaginative empathy, uh, Martha Nussbaum talks about this using slightly different terms in some of her writing, but it's the recognition um, that emotion, that, that, uh, that moral and, uh, yeah, moral and ethical development isn't just an intellectual thing. It's also, and uh, it's a more full-bodied, also emotional capacity. So uh, more, the more that I engage with people of other faith traditions, I can uh, learn to ask myself questions like, what do the other's beliefs and practices mean? What do they look like from the inside? Uh, how might I understand difference from a, a, dip, from a new vantage point? And then how might uh, the interactions I have cause me to feel a deeper, a deeper sense of interconnection with others? Uh, you can tell uh, name has come up, or at least Interfaith Youth Corps has come up, um, talks about the importance of developing skills around interfaith leadership. He defines interfaith leadership as uh, interfaith leaders are people who have the ability to lead individuals and communities that orient around religion differently toward understanding and cooperation. And so I would argue that in this category of developing skills and personal capacities, interfaith engagement can help us and help our students develop skills to help make them interfaith leaders. Which then leads to the third category. Now we're a little bit more outward facing. Interfaith engagement is important to help us as Christians partner with others in pursuing the common good. Theologian Miroslav Volf uh, puts it this way. He says, when it comes to life in the world, to follow Christ means to care for others as well as oneself and to work for their flourishing. Uh, Diana Eck has already been mentioned, um, but she has famously and often said that diversity is a fact but pluralism is an achievement. Pluralism is a stance toward or an attitude toward diversity that we can deliberately seek to cultivate. Um, here's how Ibu Patel defines pluralism, especially thinking about pluralism in a civic context. Pluralism, uh, Patel argues, has three aspects to it. 
It includes respect for identity, um, acknowledging that people have a right to form and to express their religious identities. Uh, identities, um, people's religious identities ought to be reasonably accommodated in a diverse society like ours. Um, respect for identity uh, doesn't require agreement, but it does include respect. Secondly, uh, relationships between different communities should be marked by uh, qualities like positive, constructive, warm, caring, cooperative engagement through conversation, activity, civic association, friendly contact. Uh, and Patel argues that the purpose of interfaith work is to build connections between people who orient around religion differently um, and seeking commonality without the pretense of sameness. And then uh, all of this is important because of having a shared commitment to the common good. Remembering also that uh, Lord knows there are so many problems in the world and I feel like if 2020 has taught me anything, um, it just, it just feels like my awareness of those problems is really heightened right now. Those problems are so big that if we think that only Christians are the ones who should try to address their problems, then we're sunk. Um, we, we need to join together in, uh, in being committed to the common good. Um, and speaking of society right now, one of the reasons why interfaith engagement is, is important is that our society right now is so polarized. People can barely say certain names or certain ideas or movements without uh, foaming at the mouth and that we can demonstrate uh, that it is possible to engage constructively with difference. We can seek to learn ourselves what it looks like to engage more constructively with difference and help our students learn to do that. Um, building alliances to pursue what's good, I already mentioned that one. Um, in their book, American Grace, uh, the uh, sociologists Putnam and Campbell talk about uh, the, the pal-al phenomenon. And that's the idea that forming a friendship with even one member of a suspect or marginalized religious group can improve someone's attitude toward that whole group. And in fact, a friendship with someone from one minority religious group changes that person's attitudes toward other minority religious groups as well. So if we can help our students uh, have more pal-al kind of relationships, that's good for all of us. And then my fourth and final category is, I, I guess I would actually argue this is the most important one, but Dr. Blocker has already talked a bit about this one, but I just want to mention uh, just the reminder that the greatest commandment is what Christians are obligated to follow. And I think the biggest thing that should motivate us in interfaith engagement is, uh, interfaith engagement and cooperation is uh, out of love of neighbor. Um, and uh, it, that's the Matthew, Matthew 22 is one of the places where Jesus mentions uh, that. Uh, Dr. Blocker already mentioned the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think of it was only very recently that, it, that I ever finally had the light bulb moment that perhaps the most salient feature of the hero of that story, that is the Samaritan, um, it's not just that he's an outsider, um, he's also a racial outsider. He's also, and very particularly, a religious outs outsider. And so it's, it's not just, oh, I need to do acts of mercy toward outsiders, but no, the hero of that story, the person that Jesus singles out to provide the example, is a religious outsider. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, obviously, that knowledge is important, but the greatest is love. Just have a little bit more to say about uh, uh, some things, some things that might uh, be qualities that uh, connect with love of neighbor. Um, there's, of course, a long-standing uh, tradition of uh, hospitality in many religious traditions. I'm most familiar uh, from 
Christian and Jewish traditions, um, but the importance of hospitality is something I seek to give, but it's also my willingness to receive from those that I perceive to be my guests. At times, hospitality requires the cultivation of patience, listening. Uh, Miroslav Wolf talks about love of neighbor, especially love of religious neighbor, as having uh, the following features. He says, love of neighbor includes, uh, as a Christian, I need to be committed to fighting religious prejudice. When I hear others um, saying horribly prejudicial things about other religions, I need to be committed to uh, speaking into that, to, to seeking uh, to work against religious prejudice, refusing to bear false witness. I bear false witness against my non-Christian neighbors if I'm ignorant about their beliefs and therefore say things that are untrue. I bear false witness if I, keep, if I don't open my mouth and say something, if others are saying something false about my religious neighbors. Um, we're all familiar with the golden rule, obviously. Uh, the way I think this applies uh, in particular toward other religious traditions is uh, I as a Christian need to be willing to grant to other religious individuals and communities the same freedom and respect that I want for myself as a Christian. If I come from a Christian tradition that's evangelical, and I believe that it's important for me to share my faith in a particular way, I better be willing to uh, listen respectfully if someone from a religious tradition that also um, seeks to proselytize uh, engages in proselytization as well. Um, Ibu Patel uses, uh, uses the term appreciative knowledge and uh, this isn't really a virtue, but this is another quality that I think we should seek to develop. And that is, appreciative knowledge is a stance toward other religious traditions that actively seeks out the beautiful, the admirable, and the life-giving, rather than focusing on the deficits, the problems, and the ugliness. Um, and this could also include uh, learning enough about another tradition and the exemplary figures from that tradition to be able to recognize and, and talk about positively the contributions that have ma been made by people from other uh, religious traditions. Um, Ibu Patel is really, really good at that. He's so good at uh, telling stories about Christians who have done admirable things, Jewish people who have done admirable things, humanists who have done admirable things, um, that makes me as a Christian feel respected when I hear him as a Muslim talking. Um, I just want to make uh, one final comment because uh, I know we're a little bit short on time here, but uh, an important thing to consider in interfaith engagement is that it's not just the content of belief, it's also the stance toward and the emotional force of someone's belief. Um, when uh, my colleagues and I have uh, had our students um, attend, say, interfaith dialogues in various places around the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, um, my students are often really surprised by where they find commonality with other participants and where they feel separate from other participants. And my students often feel particular commonality with several Muslim or Jewish participants, especially if those are people whose politics or whose way of articulating their commitment to their own faith um, is similar to the way my own students hang on to their Christian faith. And my students feel quite separate from some Christian participants if those Christian participants tend to be more politically progressive or more theologically uh, open toward other things. And that's one of the reasons on our campus why we try to pay a lot of attention to intra-faith dialogue. If anything, that's a very divisive issue right now. Um, I think I will stop there and uh, I'll turn off my screen share. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Larson, uh, for your insights, for your presence this morning. We're honored by it. Strongly recommend the book from 
bubble to bridge. And we thank you for your presence. We're going to end now and dismiss you. Just continue to look for in your email other programming that says courageous pluralism because we're going to have other events and other opportunities for you to engage with the grant and also this recording will be archived and we'll make sure you can see it again or maybe link it to your friends so god bless everyone thank you for your presence this morning um, thank you to our panelists a special thank you again from Bethel University to Dr. Larson. So God bless you all. You are dismissed. Have a good day and weekend. Bye-bye now.